on the banks of the Nile 230 kilometers southwest of the Egyptian city of Aswan stands one of the most iconic monuments of the ancient world, the temple complex of Abu Simbel. Carved into a mountainside in 1274 BC by the pharaoh Ramses II to commemorate his victory at the Battle of Kadesh, the temple's facade is dominated by four colossal sandstone statues standing 20 meters high, each bearing the face of the great pharaoh himself. Like the many other grand monuments built over his 66 year reign, Abu Simbel secured for Ramses what every pharaoh most desired immortality, his stony likeness standing guard over the desert, solid and immovable, for over 3,000 years. Only no, it hasn't, for as immovable as Abu Simbel might appear, today the Great Temple stands some 200 meters from where it was originally built 30 centuries ago. This displacement was not the result of some geological phenomenon, but rather an extraordinary human effort to save Abu Simbel and dozens of other ancient wonders from destruction. This is the story of the greatest archaeological rescue mission ever undertaken. Stretching 6,650 kilometers from Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean Sea, the Nile River has been the lifeblood of Northwest Africa since the dawn of human history. Every summer, the Nile floods, depositing a blanket of fertile silt over the land and allowing agriculture and civilization to flourish along its banks. But for all its gifts, the Nile can also be capricious and treacherous. Its life-giving summer floods can be unpredictable, with high waters destroying crops and low waters leading to drought and famine. These floodwaters can also only travel so far, limiting agriculture to a very narrow band on either side of the river. And while the Nile has long been a vital transportation artery, the six shallow cataracts or whitewater rapids along its length make travel difficult, with boats often having to make multiple overland portages. For these reasons, the peoples living along the Nile have long dreamed of damming up the Great River, allowing the yearly floods to be controlled, the cataracts to be bypassed, and water to be stored and diverted for irrigation. The first recorded attempt to tame the Nile was made in the 11th century CE by the great Arab polymath Ibn al-Haytham, better known in the West as Al-Hazen. Commissioned by Al-Hakim bi Arm Allah, the Fatimid Caliph of Egypt, Al-Hazen quickly determined that the scheme was impractical with the technology available at the time. Fearing his report would provoke the Caliph's wrath, Al-Hazen did what any of us would do in that situation and proceeded to feign madness, leading to him being placed under house arrest from 1011 until Al-Hakim's death in 10 21. Thankfully, Al-Hazem made the most of his imprisonment by writing perhaps his greatest work, the highly influential Book of Optics. It was not until 1898 that the first practical dam across the Nile was constructed by the British on the site of the first cataract near Aswan. Designed by engineer Sir William Wilcox and completed in 1902, the Aswan Low Dam was a marvel of engineering and at the time of completion one of the largest masonry dams in the world. In addition to locks that allowed shipping to bypass the cataract, the dam also incorporated large gates that could be opened to allow flood water and silt to flow downstream or closed to store irrigation water for the winter months. However, the dam quickly proved incapable of meeting Egypt's agricultural needs and between 1907 and 19. 12, and again between 1929 and 1933, the structure was raised a further 14 meters and an electricity generating plant added. Unfortunately, an unavoidable consequence of this expansion was to submerge the ancient temple complex on the island of Philae. Though occupied since prehistoric times, the island of Philae was first developed in the 4th century BC during the reign of Pharaoh Nectanebo I, who built a temple to the goddess Isis on the site. In Egyptian mythology, the nearby island of Begay was said to be one of the sites where Osiris, god of the underworld, was buried following his murder and dismemberment by his brother Set as you do. The area was thus long considered sacred to Osiris as well as his wife Isis and son Horus. Over the next 1,000 years, several other temples would be built on the island, helping to preserve ancient Egyptian beliefs throughout the region's occupation by the Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines. Indeed, the Temple of Isis was one of the last holdouts for this ancient religion before it was wiped out by early Christians. Of the ancient imagery in Philae's temples as graven images, the construction of the Aswan Low Dam raised the level of the Nile by nearly 15 meters, causing the Philae complex to disappear underwater for much of that year. Though various proposals were made to move the temples to the nearby island of Begay or Elephantine, the British instead chose to reinforce their foundations to prevent them from washing away. Despite this, constant immersions in the Nile began to take its toll on the ancient structures, with the silty, slightly salty water eroding away the surviving paint on the carved reliefs and slowly flaking the porous sandstone blocks. 
And so the situation remained for another three decades until another major construction project threatened to destroy even more of Egypt's irreplaceable history. In 1952, the Egyptian monarch under King Farouk I was toppled in a military coup led by Lieutenant General Gamal Abdel Nasser. Four years later, Nasser ascended to the presidency of Egypt and implemented a series of sweeping and controversial reforms. Among these was the 1956 nationalization of the Suez Canal, formerly controlled by the British, triggering a British-French-Israeli military intervention. Though the coalition succeeded in recapturing the canal, a United Nations intervention led by the United States forced it to withdraw, leaving the canal firmly under Egyptian control. Nasser saw himself as the leader of the nascent pan-Arab unity movement and sought to modernize Egypt socially, technologically, and economically to serve as an example to other emerging Arab nations. Thus, while ideologically opposed to communism, capitalism, and imperialism, Nasser took a neutral political stance and sought assistance from both Western and Soviet bloc nations to modernize Egypt's military and carry out the domestic development projects, including the construction of a new, larger dam across the Nile. Despite its expansion in the 1910s and 1920s, the Aswan Low Dam still proved inadequate with the summer floods nearly overtopping the dam in 1946. Though Greek-Egyptian engineer Adrian Doninos had drawn up plans for a higher dam at Aswan in 1952, the British-controlled government of King Farouk ignored this proposal and instead pursued plans to dam the river further south in Sudan and Ethiopia. On his ascension to the presidency in 1956, Gamal Nasser declared that, for political reasons, the dam had to be built within Egypt. Egypt's borders and turned to world leaders for financial and technical assistance. At the time, both the United States and United Kingdom were desperate to rebuild friendly relations with Egypt, which was coming under increasing Soviet influence. When Nasser asked for the United States for weapons to modernize its army, U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower agreed on the condition that they only be used for defensive purposes and that the American advisors be allowed to train the Egyptian army. However, Nasser rejected these conditions and instead turned to Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev who agreed to supply Egypt with arms in exchange for deferred payments on imports of Egyptian grain and cotton. Thus, when Nasser asked for assistance in constructing a new Aswan Dam, the U.S. and U.K. were quick to pledge $70 million, which is about $700 million today, towards this project. Much of the remainder was covered by the Soviets, who also designed the dam itself and supplied technicians and heavy machinery to build it. Completed between 1960 and 1970, the Aswan High Dam was an undertaking unlike any previously attempted in the region. Described by Premier Khrushchev as the eighth wonder of the world, one of the largest embankment dams in the world, the massive rock and clay structure stands 111 meters tall and nearly 4 kilometers long, contains 43 million cubic meters of material, stores 46 cubic kilometers of water for crop irrigation, and generates 2.1 gigawatts of hydroelectricity. But these advantages came at a cost, for the dam's construction caused the Nile for some 500 kilometers upstream to flood its banks, creating 5,250 square kilometer reservoir known as Lake Nasser. Even before before construction began, engineers predicted that Lake Nasser would destroy hundreds of settlements along the Nile and submerge dozens of ancient temples and other archaeological sites. This looming heritage crisis prompted UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, to launch the greatest archaeological rescue mission in history, the international campaign to save the monuments of Nubia. Stretching from the first cataract in Aswan to the confluence of the White and Blue Nile, Khartoum, Sudan, Nubia is a region rich in history. The region was ruled by one of the earliest civilizations in Africa, the Kerma Kingdom, until its conquest by the Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose I around 1500 BC. The region continued to be ruled by Egypt until the 8th century BC when the Nubian kingdom of Kush conquered the whole Nile Valley, its king serving as the pharaoh of Egypt's 25th dynasty. After being ruled by the Greeks and Romans, Nubia was invaded by the Ethiopian Christian kingdom of Aksum in the 4th century AD and the Ottoman Empire in the 16th before finally being divided between modern-day Egypt and Sudan in the 19th century. This long and eclectic history has left Nubia littered with historically significant sites, 22 of which were identified by UNESCO as being at risk of destruction by the Aswan High Dam. Though saving these monuments would be a gargantuous undertaking, the anticipated social benefits of the Aswan High Dam made the project's cancellation unlikely. The campaign was officially launched in March of 1960, with 50 countries pledging financial and technological support. But before any salvage work could begin, archaeologists from around the world descended upon Lower Nubia to perform one of the 
largest archaeological surveys in history. As the waters of Lake Nasser would submerge much of the archaeological context of the region, it was vital to gather as much information as possible before it was washed away, especially about the Nubian people and their culture. And as the Aswan High Dam took shape and the archaeologists raced against time, teams of engineers and architects from around the world tackled the daunting task of rescuing 24 giant stone monuments. Of the 24 sites marked for rescue, the largest and most complex was the Ramses II Temple Complex of Abu Simbel. Initially, there was considerable debate regarding the best way to preserve the temples. One early proposal by film producer William McQuitty, architects Jane Drew and Maxwell Fry, and civil engineer Ovi Arup called for the construction of a permanent rock-filled dam around the temples, with water inside kept at the same level as the Nile downstream of the high dam. Underwater viewing chambers within the dam wall would allow tourists to view the preserved temples. Another proposal by Italian architect and archaeologist Piero Gazzola called for the temple chambers and facade to be cut away from the mountain and encased in a protective reinforced concrete structure. This whole assembly would then be slowly raised by massive hydraulic jacks with prefabrication concrete supports being laid underneath until the temple had been lifted a full 60 meters. The surrounding hill landscape would then be carefully reconstructed, leaving the whole complex in the same position but at a higher elevation. Though proponents of building a protective dam argued that raising the temples would expose them to excessive erosion by wind and sand, critics countered that the inevitable seepage of water beneath the dam would eventually erode away the temple's foundations. Furthermore, even the most conservative estimates put the cost of the dam scheme at a whopping $82 million, causing the UNESCO committee to reject it outright. But while the committee initially favored Pierre Gazzola's vertical lift scheme, this too was soon found to be prohibitively expensive at an estimated $62 million. The decision was thus made instead to cut the temples apart into small blocks and reassemble them at a site 200 meters back from and 65 meters higher than the banks of the Nile. Work began in November of 1962 under the supervision of Polish archaeologist Kazimierz Michalowski. The first phase of the project involved erecting a coffer dam around the temples to prevent the rising floodwaters from interfering with the operation. Drainage tunnels were also dug below the temple to divert any seepage. Scaffolding was erected to support the ceilings and the facades and colossal statues were covered in earth and steel gratings to protect them from damage by falling stones. Then began the delicate task of cutting the entire temple into 1,036 six blocks, each weighing between 7 and 30 metric tons. This work was largely carried out by stonemasons from Italy's famous marble quarries who were able to strategically deviate from blueprints when the instincts indicated the presence of soft and unstable rock. Despite the abrasive silica dust thrown up by their cutting tools, the workers refused to wear goggles or masks in order to better see their work, leading to several being hospitalized with respiratory silicosis. Once cut and lowered to the ground by crane, the blocks were transported by truck up a custom-built road to the new temple site where they were painstakingly reassembled like the world's largest jigsaw puzzle. The transfer of the blocks was completed by March of 1966, while the final block was lifted into place in September of 1967. All that remained was to erect a giant reinforced concrete dome encasing the reconstructed temple inside a new waterproof man-made hill. After six years of painstaking work, the rescue of Abu symbol was declared complete on September 22, 1968. The final cost, $42 million, half borne by the Egyptian government and half by foreign sponsors. Soon after, the temple was reopened to the public with a dedicated airport being built nearby to allow easier access for tourists. While the relocation of Abu Simbel was the most famous project of the international campaign and the face of its success, it was far from the only rescue operation. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, dozens of other temples, tombs, and other monuments were relocated to higher ground, often with foreign assistance. For example, the Temple of Amada, the Temple of Dare, and the Tomb of Peanut were moved to a nearby site known as New Amada with the assistance of France, while the Temple of Kalapsha, Temple of Gers Hussein, and Kiosel of Kirtasi were moved to New Kalapsha with the assistance of West Germany. In exchange for their assistance, several nations received entire temples, or parts thereof, as grants to return to display in their own museums. These are the Temple of Dabad in Madrid, Spain, the Temple of Dender at the Metropolitan Museum of New York City, the Temple of Tafei in the Rijksmuseum Leiden, the Netherlands, the Temple of Elisea at the Museo Egizio in Turin, Italy, and the gate from the Kalapsha Temple at the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, Germany. 
The only major archaeological site in Lower Nubia not to be moved was the settlement of Kassar Ibrum, 100 kilometers southwest of Aswan, located on a clifftop overlooking the Nile. The site was turned into an island by the rising waters, but was largely spared from damage. Among the last sites in Nubia to be rescued was the temple complex at Falai, which now lay between the low and high Aswan dams. As with Abu Simbel, the UNESCO committee initially considered surrounding the island with a protective dam or raising the entire complex above the waterline, but eventually elected to dismantle the complex and relocate it to the nearby and higher island of Ajokia. Work began in 1972 with the erection of a temporary cofferdam around the island consisting of two layers of steel plates between which one million cubic meters of sand was poured. This allowed water to be drained from around the flooded temple complex. A detailed survey was then conducted of the surface of Falai Island in order to precisely map its topography. These measurements were then used to carve the surface of Ejokia Island to exactly match that of Philae, allowing the temples to be re-erected in their original positions. The temples were dismantled into 40,000 components weighing between 2 and 25 tons each, the transfer of which began in April of 1977. The reconstruction of the temples was completed in 1980, bringing the international campaign to save the monuments of Nubia to a triumphant conclusion. The project's success inspired the creation of the World Heritage Convention in 1972 and the modern UNESCO Catalog of World Heritage Sites, on which the sites rescued during the 1960-1980 campaign are included collectively as the Nubian monuments from Abu Simbel to Falai. In addition to preserving southern Egypt's cultural heritage for future generations and showcasing the power of international cooperation for cultural enrichment, the campaign also demonstrated that it is possible to strike a balance between preserving the past and addressing the pressing social needs of the future. As Vitorino Veronese, director of UNESCO, explained in 1960, it's not easy to choose between a heritage of the past and the present well-being of a people. Living in need of the shadow of one of history's most splendid legacies, it is not easy to choose between temples and crops.